Okay, so to start with, we're going to talk about markets and the institutions of a market and how that works. So if you remember, this, when we use this word institution, it does not mean like an actual physical building, an office in the government. Um, it really just means a set of rules and a set of norms um, that kind of establish how you're supposed to interact with people. Um, it could be an office. There are regulations that determine how you're supposed to trade with people. There's the Securities and Exchange Commission that makes sure that we don't have monopolies in the United States. Um, we have all sorts of rules that govern how we interact with each other. But we all just we also just kind of have informal rules that determine how we're supposed to treat each other. And so those those are also informal institutions. And so that's that's what we mean here. It's just kind of the general rules of how markets work and what they're supposed to do. Um, so if we look at kind of this this general question here this what is a market it is an institution like we talked about last time um, that's based on private property um, and it's a way of, of trading and exchanging and, and moving property around between people and moving services around between people it's really just a way of organizing society um, based on your reading um, this is from the reading that it's just a way of connecting people um, who want to exchange goods and services and they can improve their lot by by trading stuff. That's all a market really is. Um, but there are specific rules that govern how markets work. You're supposed to have a buyer and a seller, um, and you're, the seller is supposed to make it so that the uh, buyer wants to buy their stuff, and so there's marketing involved sometimes. Um, and that, the, like the, those rules kind of govern how the market works. If the seller decides to sell a faulty product, then the buyer is not going to use them in the future. Um, it will hurt their reputation. And so you have like this idea of competition. Everybody's trying to do the best they can to make it so people want their stuff. Um, so those are kind of the general rules of how markets work. Um, but those rules can potentially be applied to other situations too, which raises a really interesting question here of can markets be used to govern anything? Um, so we have rules that govern um, markets and how that works, where you have buyers and sellers and reputation and you check reviews on Amazon for everything that you want to find out, um, like to see if a product is good, if people have had good experiences with it. That's kind of the general rules of markets. Um, but there's been a move over the past few decades to um, apply those same rules to other spheres of life. For instance, um, you could hypothetically run a firm um, internally as a market where instead of hiring people um, for specific jobs, then you can have like competition amongst like different divisions in, in an organization. And if they, they don't perform well, then they get cut. Or like you can, you can kind of use this language of markets to, to govern how firms work. And we do see that to some extent where some divisions do compete against each other. They, they use this um, market language of competition um, to create um, kind of this this, this false sense of competition amongst different organizations and then if you lose out then you lose your job and it's kind of a, a weird way to think about it but it, it can be done. Um, governments, there's a, a common talking point that we need to make governments work more like business where if you have organizations in a large government that aren't operating at a profit then we should cut them. Um, that's one of the arguments right now against the US, the US Postal Service um, where they are often have to operate at a loss when they're delivering um, mail to remote places because the, the UPS and FedEx won't go there um, because they are businesses. And so there's lots of criticism often of government agencies that aren't operating at a profit and they need to work like a business and they have to work like a market and have all sorts of competition. Um, we see that with schools as well, school districts um, in the wake of the No Child Left Behind Act, um, started having to compete with each other um, based on school or based on uh, test scores and school performance. And so, if you started performing poorly, then in this market of schools, people had the option of moving away from your school, and then you'd start losing funding, and then that would start this snowball effect of losing even more funding and performing worse on tests, and then losing more funding and performing worse on tests. Um, so applying this market metaphor to um, increasing competition, increasing choice, making everything lean and super efficient um, hasn't really worked well for um, public agencies necessarily. Um, you could arguably govern a family this way. Um, you could have children that produce stuff and if they don't perform well, then move them to a different family or something. And this is like super ludicrous, um, but like, 
I know of families that have like family mission statements that they've written together and they have, they have like annual, um, performance reviews with their parents and it's like this really bizarre thing like they their parents are both like mbas and so like that's kind of the thing that they do they've kind of marketized the whole family structure which is really bizarre um nonprofits have often attempted to do this um where if you're a charity inherently you operate a little bit differently than a, a regular business that's why we have an mpa degree with nonprofit management rather than having you go get an mba um, because your focus is not on maximizing shareholder value. You don't even have shareholders. You're a public charity. Um, but if you start running a nonprofit as a business um, and as kind of focused on market transactions, then anything that you do that is not profitable um, should be dropped um, because you're not going to maximize your profit in, in the marketplace. Um, even if your charity exists to do difficult things and provide services to the poor um, and to provide international development services or to work on legal issues that, are, that nobody wants to touch. Um, and if you're doing that, that's inherently a a profit-free world. And so um, the market metaphor might not be the best way of governing um, that, that realm. Um, this impulse that we've seen over the past 20-ish years to make everything into kind of a market and use this metaphor of markets, um, one common term for this is something called neoliberalism, um, which has nothing to do with like liberals and conservatives and like political ideology. It's based on a different version of liberalism here, where basically it just means that um, it's an ideology that assumes that individualized arm length market exchange can be a metaphor for all types of human interaction. Um, so if you're going to neoliberalize a school system, then you're going to turn towards uh, private schools and charter schools because they can compete with each other and you're turning the school system into a market. Um, if you want to neoliberalize small governments, then you let them all compete with each other for state level grants and only the best cities win and then the, the smaller cities that don't do as well lose funding and that's just competition in the market. Um, and so applying this, this neoliberal label to situations where people are just trying to turn things into markets, that's, that's where this is most applicable. And it crosses party lines. Again, it's not like a conservative thing, like a, a Republican thing or a Democratic thing. Um, both types of administrations engage in neoliberal um, reforms. Um, for example, during the Obama administration, we had the Race to the Top initiative in the Department of Education where schools were able to compete with each other um, for based on performance to get additional grants from the Department of Education. And so it was kind of, it turned into this market type of competition thing. Um, in the current administration with Betsy DeVos as the Secretary of Education, it's turned even more towards kind of this neoliberal agenda of having um, schools compete with each other, moving resources out of the public school system so that charter schools and private schools can compete as kind of mini firms in this market of education. So it, it, it's, it's been happening since the 1980s. Um, Margaret Thatcher in the UK and Ronald Reagan here in the United States, they started leading this push towards kind of neoliberalizing everything and making everything into a market because the free market is kind of the best metaphor for everything. Um, but it's not necessarily the best metaphor for everything um, because, again, it will leave people behind. Um, it will, it, it can kind of turn its back on um, people who um, the government is supposed to serve. And suddenly, if you're not competitive enough, then you don't get the services you need. Um, we see that also with um, this turn over the past five years to GoFundMe um, for medical care, where if, uh, if you're facing medical bankruptcy, then you start a GoFundMe campaign to raise enough money to pay for medical bills. But the only campaigns that get enough money are the ones who are popular or who spend lots of time and effort and money on social media campaigns. And so it turns into this competition for of people wanting to get uh, medical care um, and only the best win out. And the people who don't have the time and energy um, or resources to run really effective uh, medical GoFundMe campaigns don't get that extra support. Um, so again, like it's a cool metaphor, I guess, to have this, this competition in a market, but it's not the best way to, to govern all sorts of things.
Um, if it was, then you would all be getting MBAs and then go work for governments or nonprofits. But that's not why you're here. Um, there's a, a specific set of tools and assumptions and um, and a, a, a different way of managing the public sector than, than treating it as a market with competition. So some arguments against this idea of markets. There are other institutions and other governing structures that are more effective and more equitable for um, specific public sector organizations or nonprofits or even families. Um, it's ludicrous, again, to think that you can run a family as a market and have competition among your children and like performance reviews. That's bizarre. Um, and so we, we don't do that because there are other institutions that work better for managing families and um, organizing society that way. Um, another argument against it is often you have something called a repugnant market where we've decided kind of collectively as a society that this should not be a market. This should not have competition in it. Um, there are a whole bunch of different examples of repugnant markets. In general, they're just things that we have decided that we shouldn't buy and sell because it violates norms. And we've kind of collectively decided as a society that, it, that we have norms against doing this. Um, in the United States, we have kind of this norm against selling organs. Um, we have organ donors, and we can give up your organs for free when you die. Um, but you can't just decide to sell one of your extra kidneys because you need extra money. Um, we don't do that um, because we don't want to take advantage of people who absolutely need the money. Um, if we started selling organs, it would most likely turn out to be like poor people selling all of their organs to rich people. Um, so that's from the selling point of view. From the buying point of view, you would end up having rich people competing for organs and paying extra money. And then the only way to access organs is to have tons of money. Um, even though we have markets against, or we have kind of these norms against this type of market, we do see it happen in real life sometimes. Um, Steve Jobs, when he was um, near the end of his life, he had pancreatic cancer, and he was on a whole bunch of different um, um, transplant lists in a whole bunch of different states because he was rich and he was able to kind of register residency in a whole bunch of states. And one of the requirements is that you're supposed to be able to get to a hospital in that state within a certain number of hours. Um, but because he had a private jet, he could get to whatever state he wanted to within that time limit. And so he was able to kind of get get high up on the transplant list in a whole bunch of different states um, because of access to money. Um, and so we've collectively decided that this is like bad. We should not have um, kind of a market for organs. Um, economists have figured out other ways of distributing organs. Uh, a couple of years ago, the Nobel Prize in economics was awarded to a guy who his life's work was figuring out how to deal with strange markets like organ markets or the market for medical residents. At the end of medical school, you're supposed to go do a residency at some hospital. And so there's competition there. But this guy helped design a system that helps match residents with appropriate hospitals and stuff. Um, and so there, there are ways around this um, that, that are fascinating, but we don't like, again, this is not a good market. We've decided that we should not have a market for babies. Um, so adoption agencies, you can um, kind of, you have to pay for an adoption process and some have different prices for where the babies come from. And then that gets into kind of repugnant land. Um, and it feels really icky um, when you um, start trying to find adopt babies that aren't as expensive and like it, it feels wrong so that's generally not a market um, we don't believe in slavery and so we don't have a market for people um, because collectively we've decided that this is bad we don't do that um, votes we shouldn't buy and sell votes theoretically we could that could be a totally legal market it's it's feasible where somebody could go and collect votes and pay for them and, and buy them up and kind of bundle them and then and then win elections but collectively as a society we've decided that that is bad and that we should not buy votes um cadavers um we don't buy dead bodies um Bodies are donated to science and to, to medical schools for um, dissection work and stuff, but you don't sell dead bodies. If we did, um, it would turn into a really bizarre market where people would just go and uh, raid uh, cemeteries and graveyards and dig up dead bodies and then sell them. Um, this actually happened back in the late 1800s when um, doctors were kind of inventing surgical techniques. Um, they needed bodies, and so they were buying bodies on the black market, and so people were just like digging up graves so they could get money. And then we collectively decided that was probably a bad idea. Um, horse meat 
is a really interesting repugnant market because in the United States, we don't sell horses um, for food. And when companies do, um, then there's a huge outcry. A few years ago, Ikea was caught um, including horse meat in some of their meatballs that they sold. Um, and we had this huge outcry here in the United States and people were like, ew, that's disgusting. Um, but in Europe, lots of Europeans were looking at us reacting to horse meat like it was this awful thing. Like we were crazy because horse is kind of a more accepted food over in Europe. Um, and so this is like repugnant markets are based mostly on cultural norms. Like a society decides we don't like this thing. And so therefore we are going to consider it bad. But it's not that it's a universally bad thing. Like horse meat you can buy in supermarkets in Europe just fine. You can't do that here because we've decided to not to for whatever reason. So repugnant markets are a thing and we should not have them be markets. Um, another argument against markets is kind of the opposite of a repugnant good, which is this idea of a merit good, where we as a society collectively decide that everybody should get it, and so therefore it shouldn't be a market. And so um, 100, years, or 100 years ago or so, we decided that education, K through 12, should be free and available to everybody. Um, and so it's kind of this universal K through 12 education that we have here. Um, we shouldn't have to pay for it. Um, be, anybody can be educated without having to pay um, because it's no longer a market. But as we talked about when we, we mentioned neoliberalism, it has become kind of a market where if you want to succeed and do well, you like if you want to get a high SAT score to get into a good university, you have to get all sorts of SAT tutors. And we saw this um, a, a few months ago with um, all sorts of scandals with Hollywood actors paying for tutors and paying for fake essays um, to get their kids into top schools. Um, and so it has become kind of a market, but in theory it shouldn't be because it's just kind of this, this universally accepted thing. Um, security is also arguably kind of a merit good. Everybody should be able to have secure private property. We don't have to um, pay for our own bodyguards and our own police forces around our house. In theory, the police are supposed to kind of protect all of society. Um, as we know, that's not entirely true, um, but should, like, in theory, be a type of merit good. Healthcare in some societies is a merit good. Everybody deserves to be able to get access to healthcare affordably and cheaply and quickly. Um, in the United States, that's not the case, but in Europe, that is the case, and it's understood to be a merit good. Um, similarly, transportation. Um, lots of other countries have um, excellent public transportation networks because collectively as a society they decided that having access to transportation so you can get from home to work to other people's houses um, should be kind of a merit good and it should not be a market um, because everybody deserves to have access to it. Um, again that's not the case throughout the United States um, but in other countries transportation becomes a merit good. Um, culture is often seen as a merit good. Um, where if you want people to have access to art or to music or to theater, um, that shouldn't necessarily always be a market. You should be able to have some access um, for the general public to get, uh, to get culture. And so this is why we have like the Smithsonian system, which is free on purpose because the founders of, of that museum system wanted, um, they, they believed that culture was a type of merit good that everybody deserved to have and that it shouldn't necessarily be a market where you, only the people who have access to money can have access to culture. And so these are kind of the, the general arguments against markets and why we shouldn't have everything um, use this language of competition and supply and demand and buyers and sellers and, and competition um, because it's not appropriate to all situations. Um, so keep that in mind, um, especially when people start arguing that government should run as a business or anything should run as a business. That's not necessarily the case um, because it can distort all sorts of um, incentives and outcomes and it's, it's not the greatest.